for Premier Media's Polity. I'm Lou Gillingombe. Joining me today is Joanne Joel, here to discuss her book, I Am Ella. Your book tells the story of Holocaust survivor Ella Blumenthal and her resilience that led to a new life in South Africa. Can you tell us about Ella's early years, including her upbringing in Warsaw? Sure. So Ella was the youngest of seven siblings, born to a, a pretty religious Jewish family um, in Praga, which is an area of Warsaw. She was 19 at the time that the that the war broke out. She was very, very close to her siblings and to her parents. In fact, she survived the war with only one member of her family intact, which was her niece, Roma, who was five years younger than her. But for the rest, growing up in Warsaw, she was a member of a very, very diverse yet homogenous, in, if I can say it that way, Jewish community. There was a very, very rich Jewish life in Poland before the war. And she describes a beautiful childhood, quite frankly, of um, enjoying um, ice skating on the Vistula River when it froze over in winter or swimming in it in summer. And she still loves swimming if she could. She's now 101, so she doesn't swim quite as much as she used to. Um, she had you know, a big enough family that there were all sorts and all types in her family. Um, although they were all religious, she had one brother who was not religious, who certainly added kind of a bit of spice and, and diversity to, to her family. Her family were, were business people. Um, they had a textiles business in Praga and Warsaw. And I think probably from that, she got her own business savvy and business sense and went on to, when she came to South Africa, run run um, a textiles business. It was a happy childhood. It was not one that was particularly laced with, with danger or anti-Semitism at the time. She has recollections of that really starting closer to, to the time of, of the war breaking out. She remembers a, a, a beautiful, happy, close-knit family um, and lifestyle in those years before 1939. Given the tragedies that unfolded in Ella's life, did you expect her to be as forthcoming as she was in your interviews with her? That's interesting. You know, Ella, like many, if not most, Holocaust survivors, for many years of her life did not speak and was silent about the, the very, very painful past that she had endured. She always spoke to her family, but not to the public um, until... Later in life, until uh, in, into her 70s, really, when she had moved from Johannesburg to, to Cape Town, um, her husband had passed away, and she she began finding a public voice and a public kind of platform, um, getting involved in Holocaust education, supported by her community, supported by her family, but she really had to come to that willingness to share her story um, through the course of her life. And so by the time I met her, she had certainly been interviewed by numerous other journalists or by the uh, Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation, which goes around the world collect collecting the testimony, video testimony of Holocaust survivors. She had been through that process with them, but she had never been through as exhaustive and perhaps exhausting an interview process as she did with me. And so while I didn't start out expecting a no holds barred type of of account of her life. Um, I think I always hoped that we would get to that, and we did, um, because we had time, because we prioritized our relationship with one another first and foremost, um, and because she did have some practice in the in the years preceding our meeting at talking about her story. So I was both surprised, but also not. <laughs> Ella recalls the many deaths which took place within her family as well as to others in the concentration camps. How have those memories shaped her? She has made it a personal mission to not only remember the kind of sense of, of the people, that individual family members that she lost and her community, but to, to, to be quite literal about it. So she has written down the names of every single one of the 23 immediate family members who died in the Holocaust and she keeps them at the back of her prayer book and every time there is an opportunity to say a memorial prayer which in the Jewish religion um, happens a few specific times a year though of course you are open to having you know retaining those memories 
um, anytime, but every time there's a communal opportunity to to honor the, the, the memory of those people who have passed away, um, she has that list at the back of her of her book and she says each and every one of them um, clearly and distinctly um, holding in mind and in, in, in heart her memory of them. Um, her memory of losing them, she recounts in this in the book the exact way in, in which each one of them either disappeared or was taken or, or died. Um, and and it's very much a, a personal and individual loss. You know, when you talk about um, the loss of, of Jews and the number uh, the number of Jews lost or who died in the Holocaust and the number is six million, it's very, very difficult to conceptualize such a large number. It's, a, it's, it's difficult to conceptualize 6,000, 600. Um, for Ella, there is that big loss of community and of, of, of a whole people, but it's very much about the individual losses of her family members. And I think that although she feels their loss still keenly, even today, she sees in that um, the opportunity to to honor their memory and legacy and to create one, you can say replacements, although you can never replace an individual, but to replace their energetic presence in the world with the family that she's gone on to create since the war. In the book, you write about Ella's experiences in the Warsaw Ghetto and at various concentration camps. Can you describe how deplorable these conditions were for her and others? The Warsaw Ghetto was her first experience of being marginalized as a Jew. As you can imagine, whenever you cram human beings together in unsanitary conditions that are overcrowded, um, all those diseases and those, the, the, as you say, the condition, deplorable conditions um, wrought havoc. So whether it was diseases like typhus and typhoid uh, from uh, starvation and malnutrition um, and then any any uh, virus or, or, or bacteria that would be around would simply spread like wildfire because they were all crammed together and all on top of each other. Um, eventually people started simply dying where they stood. So Ella describes the Warsaw Ghetto walking through the streets of the Warsaw Ghetto and and seeing you know dead bodies, corpses, lining the streets with no uh, ability to bury them, no ability even to necessarily cover them. Um, they had very few belongings left. And so they, of course, had to endure the, the, the brutal uh, winter seasons of, of Poland. And then I guess the overheating in summer by, by, by comparison. So in fact, this was, if you want to use the term, a natural way of, of culling the Jewish community because they would simply die because of disease, starvation, um, overcrowding, etc. When she was moved to to the to the camps, as they all were ultimately, um, they were transported there in cattle cars. So um, they were crammed again, maybe a hundred people to a single car, which should have been used to house cattle or animals. And uh, they were crammed together. In fact, many people didn't even make the two or three day train journey to, in Ella's case, it was a, a death camp called Majdanek, which is where she first went after the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, and then, of course, the conditions in the camps themselves were almost defy belief. Uh, the, the women were separated from the men and um, she had to share a bunk. There were bunks three, three high, say, and there would be probably about five women sleeping head to toe um, on a single bunk. The, the, the question of which bunk you slept on was also really important because, you know, you needed um, ventilation and you needed to be able to move. Um, and of course, there was they were barely fed a piece of piece of bread and some watery soup. She describes the soup that they were given, which which was really, she said, would have a little bit of rotting vegetable floating at the bottom. And they used to kind of try and hang back in the line so that they could be the lucky ones to get the bottom of the soup um, pot because that's where the rotting vegetables would collect. And hopefully they would get a little bit more sus sustenance that way. Um, if there were ablution facilities at all, um, they were filthy and communal and certainly insufficient to, to sustain the population of the camps. 
Um, and then of course, for a camp like like uh, Majdanek and then Auschwitz, which she let, later went to, and Bergen-Belsen, which is well, the camp from which she was liberated, um, there was the constant pumping of of chimneys uh, because after the prisoners were were sent to their death in the gas chambers, there were the crematoria and the the bodies were burnt and there was this twenty four hour a day belching black smoke that would come out of these chimneys. Um, there was, she she talks a lot about struggling with lice and lice, of course, spreads disease. Yet it was very dangerous to be ill because if you were ill and came across uh, presented as ill if you had diarrhea if you were getting too thin if you were if you looked too emaciated if you had typhus typhoid any of, of of these illnesses you were of course simply fodder for the gas chambers because you would be no good to the nazis in terms of a labor force so as absolutely sick as they might have been and as emaciated and as exhausted and dehydrated and etc as they might have been they had to find ways to to pinch their cheeks so that the blood would flow to their cheeks and they would look a little bit less pale or to stand up straight even though they had been suffering from you know beatings of of whoops and attacked by dogs they had to stand up straight and put their chin up and, and say you know i'm I, let me live another day um even though the conditions really <laughs> were not humane in the, any sense of the word can you explain the significance of the warsaw ghetto uprising in 1943 and how it affected Ella. In April 1943, the Nazis marched into the ghetto, which was already being depleted of, of its people by who had been sent off to the, to the camps or were dying in the streets. Um, and instead of marching into the ghetto and rounding up the Jews as they would every day, they were met by Molotov, homemade Molotov cocktails and guns and ammunition, which had been smuggled in from the Polish side, the you know, Aryan side of, of the ghetto through collaboration with the Polish underground, in fact. Um, and all the while, this entire time that the, that, the get, that the Jews had been suffering like this in the ghetto, there was a resistance movement. There was an underground movement who were collecting arms and ammunition, who were trying to tell the Jews the truth of what was happening. To their brethren you know beyond the walls of the ghetto i mean it wasn't like today the news did not travel in the way it travels today so for the longest time you know people did not believe that humans could send other humans to gas chambers and 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 put them on cattle trucks to to transport them so they didn't believe that this was what was happening to them they thought they were being sent off to labor camps but the resistance movement tried to dispel those myths and tell people exactly what they were dealing with and by the time it came to, to April 1943, they had formed a resistance army inside the Warsaw Ghetto. And, and famously, it took the Nazis longer to crush the resistance of the Warsaw Ghetto than it took them to march into and take over Poland or Warsaw. And um, it was, of course, a battle in vain. There were very few of them. They were absolutely weak, emaciated, dying of starvation themselves. They had few munitions but they used whatever they had and and as Ella describes it she said on that day there was Nazi blood flowing in the streets of the Warsaw Ghetto not only Jewish blood and um, Ella amazingly enough lived through this Warsaw Ghetto uprising it took two and a half weeks to crush the Warsaw Ghetto uprising um, ultimately Ella and the last remaining Jews of the ghetto were were smoked out the, the, the Nazis set the ghetto alight um, and had to smoke them out from their bunkers and their hiding places. And they were then rounded up and sent to Majdanek. But this, this tragic event was also, you know, a pinnacle of, of light and hope because it showed that, you know, we will not go down without a fight. And in fact, this year, we mark the 80th anniversary of that uprising, through which Ella lived and survived as well. The mental fortitude required to withstand the inhumane treatment Ella and members of her family suffered at the hands of the Nazis cannot be overstated. Yet despite this, Ella continues to live a life with a deep sense of pride and love for her family and identity. How important are family and faith in Ella's life? Pivotal. You've, you've actually identified the two most important aspects of Ella, Ella's life. It's family and it's faith. On the faith issue, 
it's 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 interesting because you know she's often asked how did you not lose your faith it would com be completely understandable that you would lose your faith as many survivors did um and she she says she finds it very very hard to explain she said it, it's it's not even something that ever wavered for her she said she knew that she had to simply put her faith in god that he would bring her out of this that there was a purpose for her to be on this earth to perpetuate the memory of her family on the subject of family um again you know as as we talked about earlier her own birth family was so close and so important to her and loomed so large in her memory that she realized that her mission on earth and perhaps she, some might say it, it's why she survived was to keep creating that family and to keep prioritize that that family and both in an immediate sense her own children grandchildren great-grandchildren and in the sense of her Jewish community family you know to stand proud as a Jew despite having been told by the world that you are worthless that you are vermin that you are that you deserve to die and to to instead cultivate a, a, a culture in her own family of dialogue of tolerance of acceptance of diversity all messages which have gone on to to prove so important particularly in our country in South Africa and of course the world and it's something that she feels is is her mission to impart to the world. She said she lived through the terrible traumas that humans could bring on other humans. And yet she doesn't believe that the answer to anything is to take up arms. She doesn't believe the, that the answer to anything is to, to separate in our differences. You know, it's to, she's created a family which in itself is pretty large. In fact, she talks about at her 90th birthday where she looked around the table and she counted the number 23 of her family members who had come to celebrate with her, which was by that stage pretty much everybody, uh, children and grandchildren. And she counted the number 23. 23 members sitting around that table in Johannesburg at the time when she turned 90. And she realized that 23 was the number of family members she lost in the war. And here they were recreated or occupying space and life and hope, contributing to the world, being valued members of society um, simply by being human. And, uh, and she realized that this was why she survived and this is what she has you know, to give. And these are the lessons that she has to teach. And so faith and family are really what she's all about anti-semitism propelled the atrocities suffered during the holocaust what is the significance of remembering such a painful past you know the the oft repeated phrase never again is so pivotal to holocaust education the terms genocide and and crimes against humanity were really coined during the Nuremberg trials as a result of these atrocities. Um, even though, of course, the Holocaust was different in its in its scale and in its intent, you know, but sadly, we have seen evidence of other genocides in, in the world and, and in history. And I think what Ella and survivors and humanity realized is that it's when we don't remember these atrocities when we don't interrogate them and um, really really pick them apart that we are most at risk of repeating them um, if we don't understand the nazi ideology of demonizing the other the kind of immense power and potential detriment of stereotype if we don't really examine that as clo closely as we can despite how painful it is to confront it and to almost reopen the wounds and re-traumatize by interrogating it if we don't then we stand in danger of repeating those mistakes and i think that ella and, and survivors like ella have realized that it is only by by sharing their experience and opening those old wounds and showing them to the world 
that they can really see any potential positive outcome from the trauma that they endured. If they can spread that message of tolerance and conversation and dialogue, and if they can acknowledge the pain and give others permission to acknowledge their pain and their sense of otherness or exclusion or discrimination, you know, then it gives permission to others who sadly might find themselves in a similar position of, of discrimination to open up and stand up and defy it ultimately. Finally, this book clearly celebrates the triumph of the human spirit. What lessons can society take away from this book? You know, this, when you think about this book or you look at the cover, you think this is a Holocaust story. It's a Holocaust memoir. And it is, but only in part. In fact, the, the war years and Ella's experience during the Holocaust are the minority of her very long life. She's now 101. She was 19 at the time of the war and, and her years of suffering were, in comparison, fewer to her years of thriving and living. And when you meet Ella or encounter her in any way, whether it's in the, the book form or through the documentary, or if you're lucky enough to have a Zoom phone call with her, what you are left with is this feeling of absolute joy and upliftment. And, 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 and it has surprised people, both who read the book and who have attended events that Ella, that Ella has been with for the launch of this book. She is all about gratitude for life. She sleeps with the curtains open so that She's woken by sun, the sunshine every single day. She never wants to miss a minute of, of life. Um, she has so she is so ebullient in, in her way. I mean, you wouldn't believe that she's 101 if you were to meet her. And by reading this book, you will meet her. You will feel like you've met her. You get her, 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 her indomitable spirit very, very quickly. Um, you also get the feeling of the family she's created because the book includes um, interviews with her, her daughter and her granddaughter and so subsequent generations to see how she's managed to infuse her family with this this absolute gift really for seeing life and seeing light far far brighter than the darkness ever was um, she has an incredible positivity and an optimism for 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 life in the world that is infectious and which really supersedes I think the darkness in her story so when you finish reading the book or when you walk out of an event that Ella's spoken at you you walk out so unexpectedly joyful so unexpectedly uplifted um and and cognizant of of what it means to live your life with a sense of gratitude despite the terrible darkness that she's seen she says she sees so much more light and that's really really inspiring that was Joanne Joel discussing her book, I Am Ella.